everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on uh, how Hasura helps meet API security goals. My name is uh, Thiru and I'm an engineering manager here at Hasura. So first I want to start off with the uh, overview of our agenda today. Uh, we'll look at the various layers uh, in API security infrastructure. Uh, then we will focus on authorization, which is, uh, as we'll show, is the hardest part of API security. Uh, we'll look at market trends, uh, like uh, solutions in, in the community today, which are uh, widely getting adopted for API security and authorization needs. And we'll look at the patterns that these uh, solutions enable. Then we'll uh, we'll deep dive into Hasra's approach to authorization, uh, which we will also show to be very flexible and powerful. And finally, we'll do a small demo. Uh, so API security is a very broad thing, uh, but broadly there are like three layers in it. Right, the first layer is the authentication layer, which is what manages users, uh, any attributes for the users, uh, identity access management, and things which are uh, very much related to a user in a system and not related to the application at all. The second part is authorization, which is very spe specific to your application or your domain. Uh, and it comes after authentication. So for a given user, what kind of permissions are allowed in your application uh, and in whatever context that request has been made, right? So as you can imagine that this is the hardest layer to implement and execute correctly. And finally, there is the infrastructure components of it, like firewalls, rate limits, uh, maybe something like password control, password rotation, those kinds of things. And today we'll be focusing on the middle part here, the authorization layer. What is authorization or OZ for short? Authorization is basically being able to answer questions of the nature. Can some user perform an action on a given resource, whatever is the resource for your application? So in many ways, it's a, it's a core type of business logic. Right, it's very tied to your business logic, your application, what your end goal is, and uh, very separate from uh, identity itself, and also the other types of security that we saw earlier, like infrastructure, and so on. So authorization also includes the abstraction and implementation for those access rights in your application. So why do we care so much about authorization and why do we call it like one of the hardest parts of uh, your system to get right? The first thing is that authorization is very tied to business logic, right? Like if you're making an order, then you need to make sure that it's an order which belongs to you. And when you're fetching some data, it's either something that is very specific to you or it's something which is specific to your group or it could be public data. So to implement these uh, specific authorization requirements, you have to uh, uh, either write a lot of code or uh, be very careful about how you implement. Authorization is in the critical path. Like you don't want uh, uh, you don't want an API request to go without authorization, so it's part of every API request. And as you can see in the example application on the right, which is a typical microservices application where there are app, different applications like Rider app or Partner app, which connects to the API gateway where authentication and other things can be done. And finally, the core business logic each have their own authorization systems inside. So it's part of every API request and it's core to your entire application. So modern user experiences are fueled with all kinds of authorization requirements like graph-based authorization or attribute-based authorization and many other things. Authorization can get really complicated, right? So in the previous uh, uh, slide, we saw that there is a microservices application which has which has multiple microservices. So as a user, you may be allowed to uh, access resources in multiple microservices, and you want to have some kind of a consistent experience there. It's very hard to write fine-grained authorization. Like this is a fundamental problem, right? Uh, 
if you want a resource and you want to be very, very granular in specifying what exact uh, access right that resource has, then you'll have to put that much effort in terms of implementation to get that uh, flexibility. For authorization, multiple teams are usually involved. For example, you will have a team which takes care of compliance, a team which takes care of auditing, a team which is uh, uh, reviewing uh, the kind of authorization uh, mechanism that is involved in your system. And if it's a large organization, you want some kind of a, a consistent pattern across all your uh, API requests, all your applications. And finally, authorization is hard to describe, but it's even harder to like uh, scale and uh, make it perform at, a, at, 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 at the performance that you need. Poor authorization can lead to all kinds of problems. Like here are the top 10 uh, web application vulnerabilities that have been found by this organization called OWASP, which, is, which works dedicatedly for improving security guidelines. So in 2021, the top most uh, uh, risk for security breach is broken access control, which is not uh, which is not very surprising considering all the complications involved in writing an efficient authorization system. You can also see a new uh, entry here at point number four, which is insecure design. Even this is somewhat related to your authorization infrastructure. Like if your authorization infrastructure is uh, weak, right? Uh, in the sense that it's not it's not easy for somebody to write an authorization rule or implement an authorization rule, then also there is a vulnerability of uh, uh, data breach. Mm. This is because of the insecure architecture of your entire application. So let's look at how traditional authorization systems are uh, built. So an authorization system goes through your uh, goes first through your authentication system, which verifies your identity and gives you some kind of scopes. Scopes are very commonly used in OAuth workflows, right? And a sample scope is described on the right side here. This is Slack's uh, OAuth uh, scopes. For example, you might be given right privileges to file. You might be given chat permissions on a particular uh, or a particular ch channel, and various such things. So these are all computed in your uh, authentication system during your OAuth flow. And then these are forwarded to your uh, web application. Very hard to scale and maintain. And this is because uh, the authorization rules, for example, if you've got a particular scope, how you're implementing the scope is all embedded in your code. So you have to, it's possible that you have to repeat a particular uh, rule uh, and you have is repeated in multiple places where different APIs or different resolvers or controllers are using that particular resource and you are going and uh, repeatedly implementing that there. It's also very hard to know where something is being used because it's everything is embedded inside the code. There's no uh, demarcation or separation between your authorization logic and your actual uh, business logic of the remaining business logic of your uh, controller. Hence, changing and adding any authorization rules can be very error prone. And this is what leads to broken access control breaches. Let's look at policy-based authorization, which tries to separate uh, the authorization from your actual code. So these are usually implemented by a rule engine, which is a separate service. A few popular uh, policy engines are OPA, Open Policy Agent, uh, but the problem with these uh, kind of solutions is that it could be a little generic uh, for your application's needs. So to do fine-grained authorization, you will have to really work uh, really hard to like implement a rule which works for your application. Right? The DX is also hard here because not only, uh, like I mentioned, you might have to do fine-grained authorization, but it's also very separate from your core business logic. So it's a different service, so it can be quite complicated. 
there is a related but uh, slightly different uh, authorization mechanism which is also getting fairly popular uh, uh, it falls under the broad domain of like graph based or relationship based authorization Zanzibar is a very good example of this it's released by Google and it has uh, uh, it has properties of like high scale and consistency but again it's it's it can be very hard to get it uh, fine grained because you can't use things like attributes uh, uh, for a particular resource there can be a lot of uh, extra hops like every time you have to access a resource you have to uh, compute something so there are a lot of uh, uh, network calls push downs are really difficult like push downs are uh, trying to put your or execute your authorization logic close to your data but it may not be possible if you have a separate system. And the DX, again, it, this being in a completely different system, uh, decoupled from your uh, uh, business logic, it can it can be hard to work with two different systems together. So let's talk about model-based authorization. So this is, uh, this pattern or this approach is the easiest developer experience because models are inherently part of your business logic or your app. If you can define some kind of authorization on a model, then you define it once for that model and you can use it in any business logic or in any API. So you do not repeat yourself. There is less duplication and it's easy to see, uh, uh, easy to audit things and easy to easy for for this approach to be compliant with uh, different security needs. The performance can also be highly efficient because uh, if you can define your permissions on the model, then it's also easy to push it down to the actual physical layer of that model. So you can, you can use uh, optimization techniques to get high performance in this approach. So let's look at a do-it-yourself model-based authorization. This is some Python code uh, where you might define a, a, an article model and you will define the underlying storage here and you will define some permissions for this. For example, owner, group, and other is like roles and you say that these roles can perform these operations. And you'll have to write some code to get even more fine-grained if you need to. Now, Hasuro is the most advanced model-based authorization solution out there. It's it's a low latency and high availability engine. Uh, on Hasura Cloud, you get uh, 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 you get high availability, and for self-hosted, you can set up Hasura in a way that uh, you can set up multiple instances. We support authorization for models over queries, mutations, and subscriptions and also remote schemas and REST APIs. If you integrate, if you bring your own, remote schemas are basically GraphQL, so external GraphQL services, so you can bring that as well and give additional permissions in a model-based way. Same for REST APIs, you can bring in your existing REST API, put a GraphQL wrapper over it, and define permissions for that. So the developer experience becomes extremely easy here because uh, you would define models for your uh, application and along with that you can go ahead and define the different authorization rules for that model for example on the right here uh, there's an example of uh, uh, a table where you're defining your role called customer and there are permissions of different kinds uh, and uh, we'll see some of that in the demo later but you can see that instead of writing the code as you might have done in in a do-it-yourself kind of approach, you can declaratively define similar rules for your model. Hasura OC is very evolved, very advanced, and it also contains pretty much all of uh, the other authorization approaches that we saw, but in a different uh, uh, mental model or a different abstraction. For example, inherited rule, Hasura has inherited rules, which means you can combine different roles together and inherit a parent role. This is similar to having a Zanzibar-like or a Google Drive-like experience where you can have uh, a graph-like structure where things in the 
things which are at the bottom of a node all inherit the permissions uh, above that node. Relationships, like in Asura authorization, you can create relationships and use permission rules on those relationships. So this is also like uh, a graph-based uh, approach. Asura authorization is attribute-based, so you can your uh, authentication system can give different uh, session variables or like request variables and you can use that in your permission system anywhere. For example, your user ID, or some kind of a team, all of these can be embedded inside your permission rules. ACL style lookups. So a lot of the authoring systems we talked about earlier are essentially behind the scenes uh, uh, ACL lookup. So in Asura, we have permission clauses like exists, which is pretty much uh, gives you the same capability where you can look up some table and say that uh, the request has permission to proceed. So we're going to combine all of this into this two-dimensional graph where we have authorization uh, patterns on, on the x-axis and the developer experience on the y-axis. Hasura is pretty much uh, on the right side here uh, with uh, easy DX as well as a strong authorization. Facts. So with this, I will show a quick uh, demo on how you can start thinking about your application and your authorization needs with Hasura. Our Hasura Cloud application here. So this is, uh, if you log into Hasura Cloud, you can create a project and you, and if you come to a data tab, you can add a database. In this database, I have a few tables, but the two tables that I'm going to be interested in are author and article. So author has two columns, ID, name, email, and I also created a relationship. Uh, two articles, which is a different table here. And let's look at article. Article is nothing, uh, is again a table which has ID, author ID, where author ID is coming from the author table. It has some content and it has a Boolean column called published, right? Can be true or false. And again, it also has a reverse relationship to author. So let's look at the author permissions now. So I have created a role called user and I have, uh, I'm giving it a select permission. And in this select permission, I'm saying that the user role can only get rows for which the ID is equal to access or a user ID. So this is an attribute which is coming from your authentication system. I can limit the number of rows, but I'm not going to set that. I can limit the columns that has that it has access to. I'm saying all the columns. Similarly, there are a few other permissions that you can set up for this particular model. So the important thing to remember here is the check is on XSR and user ID. Now let's go look at the article table. So article table also for the role user has select permissions. And this is a combination of two rules. The first one is that uh, the author ID should be equal to access to user ID. And publish should be equal to true. You don't want to show the user any article that has been not, that has not been published. And you can give uh, column permissions here as well. I've skipped the published column here. <laughs> Now let's do a query. Suppose I want to get uh, my author. So as you can see here, I'm supplying access to a role and access to a user ID attributes directly here through the headers. And that is because I'm running this with an admin secret. So it's a kind of override uh, where you can give these attributes directly. And I get just the ID where it's equal to my accessory user. Similarly, now if I run this for articles, I can see that uh, I'm only getting one article 
for id equal to 1 and with id equal to 1 author id equal to 1 which is my accessor id and it has some content now to show that i have more articles for this particular user i'm just going to run this query as an admin and i can see that i have uh, for author id 1 i have two articles article 2 and article 1 and you can guess that article Two actually was not published, which is why it didn't show up when we ran this with the book. So artic art article one, only article one is available. So I have these two more. I have permission of these two models, but now because uh, I also have a relationship, I can do the same thing and also fetch the articles along with my author. And again, I would only get uh, the result set, which has all the permissions for both author model and articles model, right? Now, if you're using this article or author model anywhere in Hasura, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's for joining with a remote schema or joining with an app, with a REST API or joining across other tables, you can be rest assured that these permissions are on, always going to be executed. Right. So once you can define your model and you can define the permission rules on that, then you don't have to worry about uh, permissions for any API or uh, any business logic on that model any time in the rest of your application development experience. And this is the power that uh, you get with Hasuro. Uh, with just like a configuration, with a YAML configuration over your models, uh, it will automatically create the kind of uh, schema as well as execute and enforce those permission checks for you. And uh, uh, you can focus on building your application without worrying about any kind of security breaches. So thank you everyone. This was, uh, this was my demo and you can reach out to me about any security needs or if you want to dig deeper into any of the aspects that we touched, feel free to reach to me, reach out to me on my Twitter or my email. Thanks everyone and have a great Hasura Con.